We have here today our mayor of Albuquerque um, to come and speak about his thoughts about this project and uh, where the state is um, from his vast experience as previous auditor and now here running the largest city in New Mexico. So for Mayor Tim Keller, thank you. Well, good evening, Albuquerque, and also folks from around the state who gathered here tonight for this. Uh, what Was that an awesome video or what? Yeah. That was really good. Excellent job, you guys. And <laughs> I love it. You know, um, so uh, that is a great question. Can we play it at the airport? I have no idea. Um, yeah, good question. We can check on it. And the good news is one of our panelists is our chief of staff, Sunali Stewart. He'd probably be the one to check on that. Uh, but it's a good idea and there might be some other areas where we can view it as well. But I also want to let folks know that uh, we are recording this for our channel 16. So I want to give a plug to Government TV. It's our own C-SPAN. And uh, you should all watch all the time. It's riveting. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but we are going to be airing it for sure on channel 16. Um, and actually, by the way, channel 16 will surprise you. They have some great programs. And I believe it's much more exciting than C-SPAN. So a couple of things that I'll just share with you. I think the video did a great job of, of you know, setting that narrative in a way that I could never do that only our uh, gifted storytellers can. So I just will, I think, maybe color this with a little bit of backdrop from my experience working on this issue. You know, number one is that when I started a, a mere 10 years ago in, in politics as a state senator, uh, I discovered this notion of our sort of tax whole program, our tax regimen, our tax policy, and where we manipulate essentially how much money we take out of your wallet and uh, where we put it. And when you dive into this, I think we discover, and what came out in the video is we discover there's all these bizarre inequities that show up, and frankly, injustices in many ways, that actually uh, are something that is, that is bipartisanly despised. So we have built a system of taxation and then spending that even on an individual basis, most of our legislators and most of our governors would agree is deeply flawed and deeply inconsistent. Yet we continue to do it year after year after year. Now, of course, the prime example of this is this notion that we do tax our extractive industries through the royalty process, of course. But we sort of decide not to collect that on a whole host of issues. And I'm not going to talk about tax policy in detail here, but there are all these loopholes when it comes to actually royalties and collections. And so the irony is, while we say that this is how we deal with our uh, inherent natural resources, how we act is actually a little bit different. We actually, we actually take royalties on a lot less than is on paper because of all these different loopholes. Now, we see this also on the other end in terms of we have needs and resources in our state, right? Because the whole concept, the whole bargain of the New Mexico tax code is that we, we are allowing our natural resources to be used, but that, was, that use is supposed to be for our public good, for public schools, and so forth. And so fundamentally, this is a challenge that many states have and also New Mexico has because we are violating that bargain. That contract does not hold true. And the most egregious example of that is, of course, this notion of methane flaring and how methane is just completely off the grid when it comes to this agreement that we made, whether we like it or not, at the foundation of statehood. And of course, you know, there's a whole backdrop to that agreement, but that's like, that's for volume two, three, and four. Um, but I want to highlight this because I think when we talk about this individually, again, people think it doesn't make sense. But we've got to get the collective will to actually change it. And that's why this project is so important. People have got to understand that we are doing things that are completely inconsistent with, I believe, our values, even if you're a fiscal conservative. And so uh, anyway. That, to me, is the fundamental thing. That is the fundamental challenge of governing New Mexico. And as state auditor, this is where I really saw this, and I think some of this comes out in the video, but the notion of when you actually get behind the dollars that are at stake, we're talking about like tens of millions to hundreds of millions to billions of dollars that we are actually at stake here in sharp contrast to those numbers like 
47th in education or 50th in education or last in poverty and then you know top in resources so these kinds of disconnects I think highlight one the fundamental challenge with New Mexico going forward that structural imbalance of the agreement that makes us work as a state and funds everything that we need but also the solution the solution is actually not as hard as we think if we actually can stand up for environmental justice and for fiscal responsibility, I mean, the amazing thing is that is the majority of the population and then some. We can solve both these problems at the same time. So it doesn't nearly scratch the surface when it comes to things like climate change and so forth, but I just want to leave with you, there is a grand bargain in New Mexico around natural resources, and it's this very notion, this very contradiction. So let me close with now my new role as uh, mayor of the city of Albuquerque. Uh, unfortunately, one of the few things is I'm a lot less involved in this issue, fundamentally at the state level, of course. But I get the chance to try and work on this at the city level. And so I'm thrilled to share that we have made, I think, a little bit of progress. One, we signed on the Paris Accords. Big step for our city. Thank you. Two, we announced yesterday that we are spending $25 million to get us hopefully to 25% renewables by the year 2025. That's awesome and we're on our way. And it's in formation, we have the pieces of it, but we are gonna be creating Albuquerque's first ever Office of Sustainability that is gonna work on all of these projects and will be transparent and accountable to the public. So we are gonna try and lead with action by doing the things that I just mentioned, but also having essentially a bureau that's gonna work on this for however long I'm lucky enough to be our mayor. And that down the road, hopefully we'll see things like distributed generation. We'll also see policy coming out that protects us from the dangers with respect to fracking and other things. And so we are finally in our uh, city, I believe, over the course of the next couple of years, going to have an office to deal with environmental justice issues and climate change and renewable energies and fiscal responsibility with respect to our electricity bill, which right now we are the largest electricity payer in the state of New Mexico. So by saving money on that, we are saving money even in our budget on the bottom line. So we're going to try and demonstrate this over the next four years or however long we can and say that there is a path forward and hopefully we'll be able to bring the state and all the other cities along with us. So that's the game plan in Albuquerque. Now, thank you. <laughs> so I think with that, I'm going to wrap it up and just share uh, this. There are other areas that are tangentially related, like our use of plastics and uh, recycling programs. These are all things we're gonna start working on at the city. And we're actually starting with our farmer's markets and trying to take plastics out of our farmer's markets. It's going to take a community effort coming together as one Albuquerque, nonprofits, businesses, etc., in a program that we can hopefully over time incentivize. And then uh, we have a whole long path ahead of us when it comes to actual recycling, especially with businesses. And so the good news, we're sort of, you know, one foot in the door on these or we're on first base and we're going to keep going all the way around. And so I'm excited to share with you what comes next. But in the meantime, let me end with this. We have to get the message out that Kavu shared with us tonight. And I know everyone in this room understands that and everyone knows that. But to me, the call to action is to spread this narrative, spread this message in each of our respective ways, whether it's parts of indivisible groups or parts of the nasty women or parts of environmental justice groups. Um, everyone, I think, has a responsibility to share this message. And so that's also why I wanted to be here tonight, because as mayor, I will also be sharing this message. But we need to share this far and wide across the state and across our country so that this story is told in all aspects of it, including the story, the perspective from, of course, our Native American folks, and it's great that we're doing this here, uh, our indigenous communities, and uh, all the way through the spectrum to the business side of that story. We need to share that in every part of our community and our society. So that's what I hope we'll do going forward. So with that, thank you so much. I'll hand it back over to our, for our panel up next. Thank you. So now, without further ado, um, I'd like to um, introduce our esteemed uh, moderator, Tara Gatewood, um, who is a veteran journalist at KUNM. Tara?
Um, and we have uh, many uh, fine panelists, including Kent Salazar. Kent comes to us um, as a board member of ECHO, um, Hispanics enjoying um, camping, hunting in the outdoors, as well as um, a board member of the um, National Wildlife Federation. Um, Phoebe Sueña, thank you. Phoebe comes with us from High Watermark, LLC. Thank you, Phoebe. Um, and then we have Darian Cabral, who is from Coda Holdings and is an energy expert um, in oil and gas. And we have Sunile Stewart um, um, from the city of, <laughs> um, from the um, uh, chief of staff to the mayor of Albuquerque. Um, and then uh, we also have Sister Joan Brown from New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light. Thank you. Please take your seats wherever you come. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And I definitely want to say thanks again to Kavu for getting us to this point to start this discussion. And our panel today represents many different walks of life, especially some of the things that were represented uh, in each of the chapters. And so I think we're at a really special moment, being in this room together, being here in, in a central location of New Mexico as well as the city. And I wanna start off at that intersection that our mayor took us to, the balance between uh, the different roads that we come to. And I think just to giving a moment to see how much oil and gas has brought to our state, both positive and negative. I think that's a great place for us to start. And I wanna go ahead and jump into the wealth that we do have here on the panel. And Sunile, I wanna call on you because you've definitely taken many paths um, in understanding our state of New Mexico. And just wanted to give you a moment to further express just how much um, you feel that oil and gas has brought to New Mexico. Does it work? Great. Well, first, let me say thank you for being here. It's a real uh, honor to be with everybody here to have this discussion. I, I think a couple of things that we need to remember. W one is how our state got tied to oil and gas to begin with. Um, you know, we have a checkerboard of land in New Mexico, uh, federal, state, uh, and private land. And there are educational institutions that are tied to that land and all the revenue that is generated off of that land goes to support those educational institutions. So from our statehood, there has been this nexus between working lands, which in the Permian Basin have tended to be uh, oil and gas, um, and uh, money that goes to support education. But it doesn't always need to, to be like that. Uh, you know, right now our budget, about 30% uh, goes to, uh, uh, from oil and gas. Um, but we really need to begin in terms of diversification, renewable energy, uh, and some of these other areas. But there's no doubt that historically uh, we've been tied uh, to this industry. It's created jobs. Uh, but as we heard, it's had a lot of adverse impacts. So we need to begin the process of transition. All right, thank you for that. And Kent, I want to turn to you. Uh, ECHO, the, the group that you are connected with, is really concerned about culture of New Mexico. And tell us more um, from a cultural perspective, your thoughts on just what oil and gas has brought to New Mexico. Well, for one thing, the Hispanics in this state uh, have worked from the very beginning on some of these industries, our extractive industries. We've been miners, you know, we've, we've worked oil and gas, we've done all that. So we're very much in favor of the, of the economics of jobs that are brought to us. But we're also faced with the fact that, that it also has negative impacts on our, on our culture. Uh, it's a waste, a waste of a resource that belongs to all of us. And that, that we, we don't take. We don't tolerate losing, uh, wasting food, wasting water. These are precious things to us. And so when we, we have industries that waste, it, it, it goes against what we are culturally uh, raised with. 
I think you saw some of the Asekia people living a very sustainable life with, with water and, and how they f used the water very sparingly. And, and they talked about even carrying water for their plants. That's the type of, of ethic we, we need to share with our, our industries have to have that as well. This is, they can't be wasting this. It, there's technology that they don't have, that they don't have to do this. And, uh, and it's costing us a lot in terms of education for our children, our health. I like to say that there are a few things that all living things need, clean air, clean water, and a place to live. And, and we're losing those when we're not capturing the methane, we're, we're losing the clean air, we're endangering the water. And, and for me, a big thing being a Hispanic that likes to hunt and fish is the, the, the habitat that's being uh, fragmented and degraded. And we charge industry to, to, to care for our lands when they have leases, that they will restore it. But traditionally, they have not. And I think that that's something that we need to hold them to as well. That when they finish a mine, that they, they restore it. When they take the coal out of the ground, they restore it. When they're drilling in our lands, that they capture and hold precious those resources that we have. Thank you for that. And I do want to let folks know that we are also recording today's discussion for Kavu podcast with Unearth. Uh, so if you also want to participate, we're definitely going to have a moment for questions and questions coming from our audience. And um, as we continue here, hearing these different voices, uh, and you want to catch up on any of the chapters or uh, connect with some of the ones that are be that will be coming up. You can find them on the website, Kavu's website. So I just wanted to let you know that. And so, um, Darian, I wanted to turn to you when we talk about industry and the organization you're with it is kind of a middle person of helping people understand both sides. And when we think about more understanding of the needs of some of the things we've heard Kent talk about, as well as the needs to grow, any thoughts you'd like to add? Hello? Okay. So um, I work with a small native-owned organization called Coda Holdings. And uh, Coda Holdings specializes in working with tribes on energy and economic development. And uh, you know, I speak to a lot of different people um, uh, in my work. And I often speak to people who are um, environmentally uh, astute, like most of you, I'm sure. And when I tell them I work with tribes, I work with renewable energy, um, solar and wind, and so forth and so on, you know, they're thrilled. Say, wow, that's fantastic. But then I say, well, we also work with oil and gas tribes. And um, there are several very wealthy and adept oil and gas tribes around the country. And um, one thing that I'm really inspired about, and one reason I'm really happy to be here, is because CAVU is one of the few organizations I've come across so far that recognizes that we have to bring people together, that we're way too polarized, and when people are arguing, nothing gets done, nothing happens. Um, we are entering the most polarized time that I've ever seen in this country. Um, you know, we're, we're facing scary issues, and um, people don't like to face scary issues. There's a lot of denial going on. Um, and so I think organizations like CAVU, you know, I, I was at a, not too long ago, one of their discussions where they had environmental people, and oil and gas industry people, um, and, they were, and, and they were talking to each other, not against each other, and finding common ground. And, and the um, uh, oil and gas is not going to go away soon. That's just reality. I mean, we all drive here in automobiles. Um, and to think that um, we're going to just turn off the, the, the spigot, you know, and, and, and stop taking oil and gas out of the ground is a fallacy. So if, uh, for example, uh, people are saying, well, why is this tribe drilling, you know, uh, for oil and gas? And, you know, they should be leaving it in the ground. Well, if they leave it in the ground in New Mexico, it's going to come out of the ground in Saudi Arabia or Russia or Iran or somewhere else because the demand is there. Um, so there's, there's a terrific book called uh, Last Days of Ancient Sunlight 
which is what oil and gas is. Um, it's ancient energy that is from the sun that's been stored underground that we all live with and around. And yes, we're facing issues here, but there's, it's not black and white issues. There's a lot of irony. For example, um, the United States, and even I think with the present administration that we have, I believe the United States is going to come close to living up to the goals that we set um, for the Paris Accords. And the reason that's going to happen is because of fracking and because natural gas is taking the place of coal. Coal plants are shutting down so that um, pollution is diminishing. But it's because we're drilling, and it's because of we're, we're drilling for, for, for natural gas, and because the price of natural gas is, l is much lower than coal. So it's, it's not a black and white issue. It's not an issue to be argued about. It's an issue to find common ground around. So um, I'm hoping that you know, Kavu and this effort can, can do that. And Phoebe, I'd like to turn to you, because the work that you're doing definitely it is speaking about what happens when the environment changes. And your thoughts about hearing from the rest of the panel on how great dialogue needs to be happening. Anything you want to add about what you've witnessed and, and what happens when the earth is changing as a result of some of the things we've presented? Well, um, I, I'd like to go back to um, you know our our public communities and how they discuss and make decisions. Many of our public communities do that by consensus. So you have, in many times, 40 plus elders, older men trying to gain consensus on one issue um, to move forward. And it requires a lot of discussion. Uh, there are opposing views many times. But if we are respectful in our interactions and our discussions, we're able to work through those issues. Um, and, and so I just wanted to add that on to what Darian was saying. But in addition to it, um, what I've seen after the Las Conchas fire, after Sarah Grande fire, after the Dome fire, and all in this, almost in the same footprint um, in the Hamas Mountain area, so what the, the, one of the gentlemen said on the video was that footprint, that fire footprint, burned three times in a few decades. So for the tribal communities, that's loss of resources, not just for one generation, not just for five years. I'm talking about my children's 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 may see that landscape back. And so, um, as Darian said, is it's always a balance as well. How do we protect and steward our resources? For this generation, for my generation, it's upon our responsibility to try to steward those resources for the next generations. But then we have economic pressures. How do we provide infrastructure, especially like for tribal communities, which Darian works with a lot, and so there's always these competing forces. Um, I work with one Pueblo who almost every council meeting discusses, should we mine? No, there's, there's a group over here who says, no, we want to steward those resources. Mining is not within our core values. But the tribe needs that monthly revenue in order to keep tribal programs open and services for the people. So it's... It, I think for the last six months we've been discussing that particular issue. No firm decision yet, but it takes a lot of discussion. And I, and I would also like to echo is as long as we keep discussing in a respectful manner, we're going to all come with our own perspectives. Um, but at some point, at least for tribal people uh, and Pueblo people, um, one of our elders once said, you know, as we throw our cornmeal with our hand, praying for our resources, the water, the air, our people, do we take money with that same hand? And so that choice is a constant pressure for our tribal leadership in particular, and which ends up 
you know, the extractive industry ends up impacting our communities and our ability to continue to steward and ensure those resources are there for our next generation. So I guess my whole point is it's just a continued discussion. Thank you. And, and let's continue speaking of people. And Sister Joan, I want to turn to you. Um, you definitely bring a lot of wealth to the panel today in the many places where you've witnessed um, impacts to communities. And, and paint that picture for us more about how some of these items connect directly to people and communities. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here and uh, for being with this panel. Um, you know, one thing that I'd like to just touch on, I've heard a number of times of the panelists, is that word steward and stewardship. And with faith communities, that's a very core value. And it comes from um, that um, guideline, law, rule in all traditions that we are to care for um, our neighbors as ourselves and to love our neighbors. And we've come to know in recent years even more so that those neighbors are the humans and the creatures and the water, as St. Francis of Assisi calls sister water humble, precious, and pure. And so um, as a Franciscan, I, I have found myself in a variety of communities, like on the, the border and uh, New Mexico Interfaith Power and Light works all over the state um, with various communities um, concerned about water, about their livelihood, about economics, about um, struggling to discern and it is what you were talking about, Phoebe, is discernment. And I think you were talking about that, too. And, and we try to have um, part of our role in a community uh, as uh, people of faith is to be impartial. And we are. I mean, we're not of any vested interest. We are just trying to hold this moral, ethical place and have conversations around that. And certainly we do get heated and move over here and back and forth, but the ultimate goal is discernment and weighing those issues of, uh, for instance, I was, um, a, you know, about a month ago, I was in the southeast part of our state, which is growing in oil and gas with the Permian Basin, and I was talking to a pastor down there, and he was talking about the social concerns from um, this. I mean, people need work, but we're also learning that um, as we heard in the film, which was, I thought, a fascinating piece, that um, jobs or employment are not increasing with um, the, you know, increase in oil and gas in our, in our state because of technology and a variety of, of reasons. So, and he was talking about the poverty that they're facing, that people can't afford to um, pay for their rent because prices have gone up so dramatically because of people coming in, there's scarcity of housing. Um, the funerals he's had, because people have been in accidents, not their own, of their own volition, but because some of the workers are stressed because they're driving long hours. Um, um, domestic violence calls that he's dealing with. And so, so it's like discerning this, the, the economics of it and how that funds our uh, part of our state education but the social elements as well, and then the ecological elements. And um, in the last couple of years, I've gone a lot to uh, Pope Francis's On Care of Our Common Home, that encyclical, which is uh, a marvelous document that he wrote for everybody. And it really is for everybody. And he talks about economic ecology. Don't you love that? And it's coming from both of those words, economic and ecology, come from the root word eco, which in Latin is oikos, which is about our home and relationships. So I think all of us here are talking about relationships, and that's what it's about, and how we discern, hold all of this complexity together, because we all love life, and we're a part of life, and how do we move into that in the, into the future? And I think this is a, a great moment to just kind of reflect a little bit on what we've heard on the panel. And I want to take it to a, a news segment, leave it to the journalists to take us straight to the news. Um, but as you're hearing from the different panelists, you see where their backgrounds are coming together. And I wanted to bring us to a recent report that came out uh, in the Journal of Science. And maybe uh, you've read it or people in, in our audience have read it. Um, and, and I'm going to look directly at the articles because I want to make sure that I'm giving you good numbers. Uh, they published a, a study 
not too long ago, this month, that the rate of methane emissions from domestic oil gas operations is about 60% higher than the current estimate from the Environmental Protection Agency. And we heard a lot of this discussion in the films, especially in chapter one, taking a look at this. And so it seems this story continues to grow too about venting and flaring. And let's reconnect to some of these spaces that the panel has opened up and our thoughts on how we make sense of this or how we understand more and how do we get to the bottom line of just how much is being emitted and, and really are there other ways we haven't thought of to consider some of this? And so I, I wanna go ahead and, and start with you, Darian. Any thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts on that. And um, <laughs> one reason I'm here is because um, I do business plans for companies. And in 2015, I did a business plan for a company I'm not gonna mention because I'm not authorized to speak on behalf of this company, but I'm gonna tell you about the company. Um, I, I actually called the, uh, the, uh, one of the people that, uh, that own the company and, and tried to get permission or, or have him come and, and, and talk about this company, but he wasn't available. Um, so uh, when I did this plan, um, I found out that this company they manufacture what's called midstream oil and gas equipment. It's things like dehydrators, um, um, separators, um, and if you know if there was oil and gas people here, they would tell me the full range. Um, and this equipment is uh, installed at the wellhead, and is what it does is it separates water, it separates hydrocarbon, it separates natural gas from oil. Um, and uh, and uh, this company does this equipment, manufactures this equipment, sells this equipment, and um, all of their uh, equipment is zero emission. And the reason it's zero emission is because the gentleman that started the company um, was a genius. Um, we, we met him uh, when we started this plan. He lives, he lives in Farmington even though the company manufactures in Oklahoma. Um, and he figured out how to ma make this stuff and, and not uh, have it emit any methane whatsoever. Um, and it's the only company, I believe, at least when we, when we did the plan in 2015, in the world that is zero emission. And if you go on uh, the web and you look at zero emission, and you look at the EPA site, um, uh, there's directives that talk about zero emission equipment and uh, uh, advocating the use of this. And, they, and EPA did an analysis. And uh, the only company that makes this stuff is this one, this one particular company. Uh, so the technology is there. Um, the company has been losing money ever since it started, about probably 15 years ago. It's been losing money since I did the business plan in 2015. Um, and it's, it's barely staying afloat right now, even though their equipment is in the, all the major oil basins and it's been purchased by most of the major oil companies and it's been proven and tested. Um, and uh, the other significant thing about this company is that their equipment captures fugitive emissions and, and, and captures uh, vapors and so forth, puts it back into the production stream um, it can eliminate flaring, uh, and when it goes back into the production stream, uh, it actually pays for itself in within six months to two years. So there's no reason why uh, companies aren't buying it, using it, but they're, they're not. They, they, they are to a degree, but they're not. Um, and I think one of the reasons is because um, oil and gas people are used to doing things a certain way, they've always done it a certain way, and unless they are forced to do things through regulation differently, they won't. So when we did this business plan, it was when Obama was in office. Um, we were looking at Colorado, Governor Hickenlooper, uh, as, as a model because they passed regulation uh, to limit methane and, and emissions, and, and we were thinking, well, that's going to be a national model, um, so that's coming next. And just one, one more thing I want to mention about this, and, and that is 
besides states being national models, the entities that make the most sense to be models are tribes, because tribes are sovereign, they're self-regulating entities. A tribe can pass regulation that says, we're going to have zero emission on all the wells on our reservation, um, and that's the law. And if they do that, then this company you know, would be selling that um, equipment uh, to oil companies that are working on, on reservations. So th that's something we were talking about this. We were talking with the Northern Ute, for example, um, and it hasn't happened uh, sure. for various reasons. But it's, it's, it needs to. And Darian, let's unpack that a little because there's a lot there. And when we uh, think about this, and, and a buzzword that came up in some of the things you're saying are regulations. And I think this past spring, many people who have been watching just how regulations may have been rolled back, fluctuations. And, and I want to go ahead and turn to Suni Lay because this often is the intersection where people turn to lawmakers or, uh, in your case, here in the city. And we heard earlier from the mayor initiatives and steps to think about this on a city level. But let's talk a little bit about how regulations come into play. And I think we also hear sometimes, too, that people in the industry feel that states are the ones who should be regulating some of this. So big um, question, but go ahead. Uh, your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. So number one, I would say that there is a lot that can be done without dealing with the federal government. Um, obviously, right now, the political climate is such that I'm not going to expect a lot of, out of EPA and, and regulations are being rolled back. Um, but it doesn't mean that there's not a lot we can do. I mean, in New Mexico, we've got about 13 million acres of subsurface uh, land at the state. That's tantamount to what the feds have. Um, so we have a, a, a tremendous opportunity at the state level to actually drive change whether or not the feds are, are willing to move. Um, and a couple of just concrete examples. So one, I, you know, just doing what uh, Colorado did in terms of regulations is something that the governor could do tomorrow. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science in terms of requiring um, more sensible regulations that capture, that track, you know, flaring um, and, uh, and requiring um, uh, that not to be wasted as a resource. Um, also at the state land office, uh, th there's a lot that can be done in terms of the land commissioner that really has tremendous authority over all of this, uh, you know, 13 million subsurface sur acres that we have. Um, and in that respect, you can do a lot in terms of, uh, you know, pushing back to deal with the pipelines that are leaking, uh, also requiring less waste in terms of uh, the activities that occur on state trust land. Uh, but also the legislature really needs to act. Um, we have a statutory lease in New Mexico uh, on state trust lands that essentially incentivizes waste and uh, limits the ability of the land commissioner to really wrap in that industry and ensure that there isn't waste. So there's some very concrete items that we can um, uh, tackle. Uh, that that whether or not the feds are, are acting, that, that we can still do uh, locally. Thank you for that. And Kent, I want to turn to you, just reading some of the material coming from ECHO and the different stances that they have taken with the possibility of rollbacks on rules and regulations on venting and flaring. And talk to me a little bit more about what you see in terms when we see fluctuations of uh, of rules and regulations on some of this, how ECHO is bringing more voice to how you feel it's going to affect not only the environment, but communities. Well, I think our communities have, have stated this, that we, we, we don't like the waste. It's, it's affecting our children and educations, health. It's possibly affecting water, which is sacred to us, like it is to most people, I think. And I think that some of the comments that just get, like Darren said about, there, this is, there's technology there to, to handle this. We know that. Um, it's a matter of them doing it. We've had some industry people 
Exxon in the Permian Basin, I believe, has voluntarily started implementing some of this. Maybe they see the writing on the wall or something, but they're doing it. It can happen, and it can happen and still maintain jobs and, and produce money for the state. But we're seeing resistance up in the San Juan. I don't know why. We passed a methane rule and uh, with their input and stuff and, and looking at Colorado and other states like Wyoming, there's a possibility we can do this. They have sued nationally to, to stop that rule, I think four times. I think we've won three and we lost the last case and stuff like that. And that's a, a lot of people working on this. So if we have the will as a, as a people, as citizens of New Mexico, you can see the tribes, the state, you know, the industry, if we have a will, we can do this. We can stop wasting it. We can stop affecting our children. We can, we can have clean air and clean water, and we can have jobs. You know, we can have money from the resource. And, and I think we can do it if we just all work together on this. I, and by the way, I like Kavu's statement about bringing them to the table, too, because they, they have been here before and talked. And I think that's important that we need to have this conversation. All right, thank you for that. And Phoebe, when uh, Darian was talking a little, talking about tribes uh, being that possibility or that place where we can see good models, you work directly with tribes and, and you uh, gracefully painted, you see it uh, many different ways. And, and sometimes people are still in discussions of whether they should develop or not. But when we think of tribes as possibly being the leader to give a model, what's your reaction to that? I think absolutely. We're, um, we have to also remember this land is Pueblo, Navajo country, Apache country. Um, the Pueblos have sustained, we're in our third government. <laughs> and so we've absolutely demonstrated resiliency in this landscape. And in, in terms of being that role model and that mentor, um, I think absolutely tribes can set an example that others can, can stand behind and start to follow. Um, one of the things that I think is um, really interesting about this topic, and again, it depends on the priorities of the tribe. Every tribe here in New Mexico has tribal sovereignty. And I see, I work with tribes that are very progressive in terms of economic development and willing to take and, and willing to make those hard decisions to maybe do um, drilling, fracking. Um, I work with tribes that are very traditional who firmly believe that to drill is hurting the Mother Earth and firmly believe that if we start to drill, we are disrupting the balance, which disrupts and reduces the potential sustainability within the landscape that we've been provided. Um, and so back to your question is, I think tribes can be that role model, even on the economic side. If, for, um, as Darian was saying, those tribes that do develop and start to produce oil and gas, but they do it with that core concepts in, uh, in terms of stewardship and resiliency for their people. And as well as those tribes that don't want to do it, can they, I'm working with a couple to develop regulations that are very strict so that generations of tribal councils to come will have a document in hand and know what the former tribal councils decided upon and why they decided upon that. Um, as an example, um, which is actually a, a, a clean energy for Cochiti Pueblo, uh, when the dam was built, there was many proposals by companies to install hydroelectric at the dam, which is clean energy. But because of what is at that particular location and the sacredness of that particular area, the tribal council decided to not do hydroelectric at the dam. And in fact, worked almost a decade to pass a law at the congressional level to say that there should not be hydroelectric at the dam. And so it was that decision our elders made 
in the 1980s, and guess what? We revisited it in 2014, where there was a lot of effort to start to examine whether hydroelectric was good or was a potential at that location. And what I, I had to do on, as a request from the governor was pull out all the documents, pull out all the depositions, pull out all the language as to why the tribal council decided not to do hydroelectric at that particular location and provide it to the younger councilmen the 30-year-old councilman, the 40-year-old councilman, and when they read it, their, their mouths dropped open, and when they were asked again, do you support this, they all said no, because they knew why and fully understood why the elders said no. So long story, but that's, that's kind of the, the, the many, the, the large spectrum. And it's really an exciting time to be thinking about all of these things, and it seems that each time we take a look at a different chapter coming out of Unearth, something is happening in the news that directly relates to what the people are talking about. And um, I want to turn to you, Phoebe, again. Currently, we are seeing discussions about the reorganization of the Department of Interior. and. Is it even possible to think of some of these things with possible changes? Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion as to just exactly what the reorganization is going to mean, not only for tribal communities, but for states and um, leasing and decisions there. And so as you see change coming, even in the way the things are organized, can we still be thinking of these? Or is it time to start other dialogues that are connected to it? I think absolutely it's time to continue to work on these efforts um, because the pendulum's going to swing back at some point. And just like climate change, there's this up and down, up and down. That's the same thing that we see um, with governments and with policy. And even the general public, we start to swing the pendulum a little bit to the left and then it, oh, we go back to the right. So right now, as we start to swing, um, or as we start to see the pendulum swinging, maybe in this case to the right, we gotta continue to work because we have to be prepared when the opportunity arises, when we can implement what we've really thought about and planned for and looked at and made decisions on um, so that when we see that opportunity and that pendulum swinging back, whether it's oh, okay, now we, at the state government level, can we start implementing better regulations? And here we've got all, we've done the homework already. We've got to do the homework now, even, even with that thought of the potential of change down, down the road. We've got to continue to do our homework. And so I, I really advocate a lot with the tribal leadership when, it looks like the horizon looks bad and um, you know all these obstacles or challenges in the way, continue to do your homework because there's gonna be that opportunity in the near future and maybe in the far future um, to make change happen and then the long-term benefit of the people. Okay, and I wanna share with you just talking a little bit about uh, the reorganization with the Department of Interior and it kind of applies to many of the different things that we're talking about. Uh, this is a quote from the U.S. Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke from the Bismarck Tribune. He said, I don't think the government should be in a position to be adversary. We have to, as Interior, be a better partner. We have to work with industry. And he said this as he delivered a keynote speech at the Williston Basin Petroleum Conference in Bismarck in May. And so just any thoughts from the panel? And uh, I do wanna let folks know who um, maybe are finding this in our podcast and are just tuning in. We are welcoming in a panel of guests to give us a variety of thoughts and insight into some of this. My name is Tara Gatewood, and I wanna go ahead and turn it to Kent. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think that uh, we've, We've not been adversaries, I would say, with uh, our public lands, with, with uh, the oil and gas. 
but there are some places that that uh, have greater value that shouldn't that shouldn't be drilled or mined. Uh, and that's why we set those places apart. Uh, I'm I'm a wildlife conservationist, and uh, I know that there's some places where the deer come down, like off the Rhone Mesa in Colorado, or or uh, some of the mesas in Colorado that come down to New Mexico, and that's their way of living. When when we have heavy storms, they come down. We have areas where they breed, where the elk breed. They don't like to be disturbed. Those places should be sacred during certain times. We should not allow industry to, if, if we're gonna lose our wildlife, we lose an industry as well. Uh, we have a outdoor industry here of, it's $9.9 .9 million in New Mexico. It's a billion dollars. It's, it's 800 billion nationally or something. And you endanger things like that. We, a lot of people come here because it is the land of enchantment. It's beautiful. We have, you, I think you saw in the films that David did and, and Kavu did that they're, they're, it's gorgeous. We have wildlife and, and that's a great thing that we need to hold on to. And so we, I don't think we are adversarial. We need to maintain certain places. Industry, I think, has a way of drilling. We talked about those laterally drilling or, you know, from one place. That, that's great, I think, because that protects, keeps the fragmentation of habitat to a minimum. If they do it wisely, we can work together, we can live together. We can have, if we close the roads after we've, you saw some of those pictures where they had like a checkerboard of wells and a zillion roads. If we maintain it just so we have one road with feeders or we drill laterally, we do a lot of things, we can, we can have everything. We can have the, the, the mountains, the clean air, the wildlife, and we can have an in industry working there. All right, thank you. Sunle, anything to add on the Secretary's comments? Yes. Good. So I, I think the notion that we are somehow adversarial to the oil and gas industry is just absolutely uh, preposterous. Um, I would love to have adversaries that give us, um, that would give me hundreds of million dollars in, you know, subsidies that uh, don't change your conduct at all. Um, you know, I, I remember um, some years back, uh, the big five oil companies were testifying before um, uh, the Senate uh, Energy Committee, and a simple question was asked. If we get rid of these uh, tax incentives, will you change, that are subsidizing their activities, will you change your behavior? And they said, no, we'll continue to drill and do exactly what we've been doing. Um, so we're giving those subsidies at the federal level. We're giving the subsidies at the state level. Um, you know, we are uh, giving away through waste or subsidized royalty rates um, across the board. So, uh, you know, the notion that we have been tough on oil and gas uh, is just, uh, is an interesting take on um, uh, on a reality that I don't think exists. But. And Sister Joan, I'm I'm reading a little bit of dialogue on your face. Um, any comments? Go ahead. Yeah, um, you know what I'm thinking is, um, you know, there are many people in this country who are of a faith tradition, uh, or certainly people of faith and conscience, if they are not part of a, a particular church, and think, oh, where do they leave those values, those ethics, that morality, um, when they walk outside of their mosque or temple or church or meeting house? Because it, it feels like there's just um, sometimes like this comment left those values someplace else, and they're not translated into business in an ethical way. It's like a, a misinterpretation that people often have of the book of Genesis, that we are to have dominion over everything, when actually the interpretation of that particular passage is we are to be gardeners of the garden, caretakers, caretakers of all that we have been given in the natural world. And I, I just loved what you were talking about, um, how you you were discerning again and again with um, the community and your Pueblo and the elders. And, and that's what we need to be about, I think, is this kind of discernment. And when you mentioned um, th this business, I was, I was felt so sad for this business is doing the right thing and it's not making any money 
And I'm thinking that's a very good example of this uh, economic ecology. It's taking everything into consideration in an ethical, moral sense and saying, how can we do the right thing for the common good, knowing the complexities and the limitations that we have? And um, we, we have to be living those things out in our hearts and in our business practices and in our families and communities. Thank you for that. And we can start taking uh, questions from the audience. And if, does anybody have a question now? Start right here. Yes, <clears throat> my name is Dodie Hawkins. And my question is, it seems so obvious that to capture uh, the leaks and flares and the, I mean, it just, why not? And, and Darian, you said that the oil and gas industry like to do things their way. Well, I mean, wouldn't they benefit? I mean, my understanding is that they would make a lot more money because they would have more product. I, I simply cannot understand the resistance of the industry. So yeah, let me respond in, um, in a couple different ways. Um, one thing I want to mention is that one of the people that's not here on this panel, and I think it's kind of an oversight, is someone from the industry, an oil and gas person. Um, I think you know they need to be here. I'm certainly not a technical, I don't know, you know technical um, uh, information about this industry and what works and what doesn't work. Um, and at the same time, I think we need to recognize uh, where industry does play a constructive role. For example, right now, the largest investors in renewable energy in the world are your oil companies, your big oil companies. And they realize that oil is not in the future. And so they're diversifying. And so that kind of stuff needs to be recognized. Um, and um, I think, you know, it's, it's, your, it's probably your, your, a lot of, well, you know, I, I, I can't say, but a lot of your smaller companies um, you know, they, they're just used to doing things a certain way. They figured out all their profit margins a certain way. They've done things that way forever. And it's hard for industry people sometimes to change, which is why regulation, and not just regulation, but smart regulation is important. And I believe, and, and my experience with uh, doing this business plan kind of bears it out, that there is regulation that's win-win. It's a win for industry, it's a win for the environment, it's a win for people, it's a win for the state. Um, and you know, because of my experience working, for example, with Coda Holding, I think that tribes can be a laboratory, potentially, for that kind of regulation and, and show that it can work. Tribes can make more money, they can protect the environment, and, and, and so those things have to happen. Um, uh, so that's hopefully the direction that we're, we're Okay, thanks. We'll go ahead and go with uh, another question. I wanted to ask the gentleman in the end here, um, given, if you were given that the fracking industry were using um, very safe chemicals and the safest process and uh, for our water and so forth, would you not still be worried about earthquakes? How do you feel about that? Well, I think that, that it's been shown when we have a certain density of fracking that you do have earthquakes. Again, if you don't have that intense density like that, and if you're, and I'm not a driller, and I'm not an industry person, but I know that, that if, they, if they do it right, you don't have that problem. It's when they, they, they do some of those grid patterns like they have done in Oklahoma and in, in southwest Texas where there's just intense fracking, intense drilling, that you're starting to see those type of things. So you, there's a, another point for industry. They said that they could not do some of this. We had an industry person at one of the cover things. He said because they'd lose a lot of orphan wells, which are not on the pipeline. They have to truck their, their product in. And, and, uh, but the fact is it's not economic for them. It's barely economical right now to do that. So that was one of the things they were saying that they would lose. And I see, these are all balances, I things that we need to balance, I think. The value of, of our wildlife, our lands, our air, our clean water, no earthquakes for our houses. Yet, you know, these are things we need to balance. We can have this industry. We can have all these things if we do it right and we work together. 
Thank you. Any more questions? Tara, can I, can I, please can do. I address? So um, I've been working on the citizens working group for Sandoval County for an oil and gas ordinance for the entire county for the unincorporated areas on private lands. And um, I've learned a lot. So my background is environmental engineering, but I've learned a great deal working on this. And one of the things in terms of earthquakes that I've learned is it's not actually the process of fracking, the vertical and horizontal fracking, yeah, and they do create small explosions, but it is actually the, the wells going back in of the re-injection of the water, the dirty water that's produced from the fracking process, that actually, that's where the earthquakes end up a majority of them, that's the cause of those earthquakes. So if we, again, understand the process, so if injecting, having injection wells in uh, maybe a very sensitive geologic area may minimize the potential or reduce the potential of earthquakes down the line, that can be one bargaining chip or one thing that we can look at. So maybe in a highly fractured area, you don't want to have injection wells because that will promote earthquakes, as an example. Thank you. Any more questions? And, okay. Uh, this is to anyone that wants to answer it. Um, I'm just, my concern is the uh, we've talked about transition and and good things are happening and there can be more uh, cooperation between different sides and eliminating polarization. But my concern is the rate of change in the environment versus our ability to have a rate of change in the way we look at look at things. And that's, that's I guess it's kind of a question. Anybody like to take that? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. The scary thing is that we may have already reached the tipping point. Um, it may be too late, um, but uh, I think that there's, you know, this, and this is my personal opinion, there's so much at stake um, that we, you know, we can't stop trying, uh, especially in the current environment, you know, to, to move in the direction towards protecting the environment and towards mitigating climate change. And I think we're missing a big, big opportunity right now because climate change is a universal Earth movement that affects everyone on the whole planet. And climate, the, you know, the, the, the working to mitigate climate change is a force that can bring everyone, countries, you know, whatever political persuasion you, you, you have, it can bring everyone together and unite people in a common cause. I mean, when 9-11 happened, this country was more united than ever. Um, you know, we, we just had a, uh, not too long ago, a uh, economic development uh, conference in Farmington because of the, the issues, the economic issues and, that are going on and the, and the price of uh, oil and gas and so forth. And, and um, we brought some people in from, uh, uh, I think they were from Minnesota. And one of the things that they said is that an economic crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So I want to make, uh, <laughs> want to modify that a little bit and say an ecological crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And right now, we're wasting it. Thank you. Sister Joan, you have something? Yes. 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 <laughs> so it's an excellent question. And um, you speak of an economic crisis, you're speaking of a climate crisis, and uh, a number of years ago, I think it was John Paul II, the Pope, said, we are not in a climate crisis, we're in a spiritual crisis, a soul crisis. And actually, uh, on Care of Our Common Home, that encyclical, it really is talking about, ultimately, what does it mean to be a human being right now, living on this planet? And we can have <clears throat> technological solutions, Interfaith Power and Light, we work on solar and energy efficiency and all these things, but the ultimate thing, I think, is looking into our own um, persons, our own humanity, our own souls, individually and collectively, 
And what is the meaning of our lives? What are we called to do? How are we called to do it? And there's no quick fixes. And we, this is a huge, huge uh, transitional moment for us, I believe, in our consciousness and in, in who we are and who we're guiding our children to be. A little story. We, this um, summer we have a summer intern. And she's a, a wonderful uh, woman who is uh, going to be a senior in college. And she is of no religious tradition or background. She's been very concerned about climate change. She's been working uh, with environmental groups and things on this. But she wanted to work with us. And she's thinking, possibly, she's discerning if she wants to study religion and ecology. Because she sees this is not just an issue. And it's not doing this, um, this action or this petition or this. But there has to be some deep worldview shifts and changes in who we are. And so I, I, that engages all of us, I think, at a, a very deep and a new level, and us collectively and together, all of us as one in our diversity, to really uh, work together and to inspire one another and to be hopeful and come up with very creative, undreamed of um, solutions that we haven't even thought of. But we have to uh, draw from this deep place um, and with many, many diverse voices in order for that to happen. So I'm certainly hearing that dialogue is a solution and a way to address some of this. A lot of times people also turn to renewables. And uh, Darian, is there anything you can share about thinking of that as a solution? Well, renewables are obviously part of the solution. Um, they're not the whole solution. Um, you know, people talk about, um, well, let's just you know, st uh, stop oil and gas industry and, and, and use solar and, and wind for generation and so forth. And uh, you can't. Um, you know, solar and wind are intermittent sources of energy. Um, you need to have energy 24-7. Um, so they can't fulfill that demand. And they also don't provide the amount of jobs that uh, oil and gas, for example, does provide. Saying that, though, um, uh, I think a lot of the answer is technology. Um, you know, uh, people are working on battery storage right now to make renewable energy uh, more robust. And um, there's, uh, you know, th there's, there's new sources of energy. I'm, I'm trying to think, there's, am there's amazing sources of energy that are kind of uh, being thought of or being experimented with, you know, from the, from the uh, what's what's the uh, when you duplicate the the uh, the so the solar um, uh, I forget the term, but you you, you use like this huh fusion fusion yeah that that's people are working on fusion people are working on I mean there's wave energy there's uh, uh, there's there's so it's 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 a big field and and so you know this this country right now should be government I, I kind of believe in in government industrial policy you know so I think the, the United States is, is retreating from that but um, energy is an area that the government needs to be investing in not not hands off but uh, encouraging and, and encouraging new development and um, and unfortunately right now we're not and I, I think that that's that's part of you know the answer is going to come from many many sources Great, right, thank you for that, Darian. It looks like we're about a minute before wrapping up our discussion here in podcast, but Kent, any thoughts and, and furthering the discussion on solutions? Okay, I was just gonna answer your question again too. I think it has gone too far as far as uh, climate change and stuff like that, but nature is resilient and shouldn't we be the same? Are we part of nature? We shouldn't give up. And we're, lo we're looking at losing 50% of all the species in the world, wildlife species. And, and we, need, we need to work on all these things as part of nature to stop that. So we shouldn't give up. No matter where we're at now, we've gone too far, we shouldn't give up. One Thank you. Question. And um, There's one more question here. OK, we'll be able to take some more in just a moment. But that's going to go ahead and conclude our podcast. I do appreciate our panel here, also Kavu, for providing the space for this dialogue. More chapters will be available as we continue. Uh, the next one that is coming up, 
uh, includes living with oil and gas in the San Juan Basin coming out uh, in July, and another one coming up is living with oil and gas in the Permian Basin. Thank you very much for tuning in and being here too. And so we have time to entertain a couple more questions. I, I would like to, the panel to discuss the whole issue of water. In fracking, doesn't, isn't the water polluted and not potable for, for human use? What, what, what are people doing about the whole issue of water? Okay. Um, absolutely. And that's something that we didn't really touch upon during this uh, panel. Uh, one of the things that I've learned, again, working on the CWG is the water is, again, very precious here in New Mexico. It's very limited. And there are very limited technologies once water is contaminated to clean it back up. And those limited technologies that do exist are very expensive. So we have to ask that question. If we want to stay here in New Mexico, we need to protect the clean water, the drinkable water that we currently have because it's very limited and once we contaminate it, it is very expensive to clean up. And so, but once it's out of sight, out of mind, down injection wells, there's not, not that forethought. And I wanna tell a quick story here. So I did a lot of work, environmental remediation up at the laboratory. So that's where the Manhattan Project um, was born, the, the atomic bomb. They had laboratories up on the hill at Technical Area 1, um, septic systems, they were almost all on septic systems for a number of years. And those septics, when they daylighted out of the building or uh, just past the buildings, they had plutonium, different chemicals in there, right? So they had a guy walking around with the Geiger counter, whoa, it went, went off. I said, oh man, oh well, it's because the pipe ends right here. So I said, oh well, we'll just extend the pipe past the fence. So they extend the pipe past the fence. So then the guard, walk, you know, walking around on on the outer side of the fence, his the Geiger counter goes off. I said, oh man, it's hot here, and that's oh, it's because of this pipe right here. Oh, well, let's extend it off the side of the canyon and then goes down a couple hundred feet out of sight out of mind right so you know uh, you know i i'm not trying to trying to disrespect those people they were just doing little bits and pieces so one thing we have to remember though is in new mexico precious resource water is limited resource we can't further contaminate those water resources and so that's a huge consideration when we talk about how do we continue to do fracking in New Mexico, not just in the San Juan Basin, not just in the Permian Basin, but all of these other potential areas that have yet to be mined, like Sandoval County. Thank you. The one thing that bothers me is the irresponsibility of the corporations. If there's an oil spill, they they might say, "Well, we'll make a, we'll make a settlement," but the people that are involved and the people that are hurt by the by the oil spill are left with the with that problem for the rest of their lives. So. Um I just want to say I, I'm in total awe of, of Phoebe Sweeney. I mean, she's an amazing engineer and has cleaned up the amazing things to clean up after the fires in Los Alamos. I mean, Phoebe's incredible, you know. And um, and and, uh, but also I want to address um, uh, what you said about fracking. And and the little that I know about fracking comes from a, a woman that I met with my partner, uh, Pat, named Patty Limerick, who's with the Center for the American West up in. Uh, uh, University of Colorado in, in Boulder, and uh, and again I, I learned everything I know about fracking really from from her, and uh, 
and she, it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to frack in New Mexico because of the scarcity of water. But, one, but I think fracking also has a bad rap. And uh, as we heard in the, in the movie, um, fracking has been going on in New Mexico since the 40s. Excuse me? Yes, vertical. And now we, now we have horizontal drilling and, and fracking horizontal. But um, the, the, uh, if fracking is done right, with the right kind of regulations, and Coda Holdings, for example, did produce, um, in, in fact, uh, uh, the person that, that did most of that work just left, um, frack regs for tribes to adopt that could be models for not just tribes but for the rest of the country so that fracking is done right. But, it, but uh, when the water is injected, um, it's usually so deep that it goes way deeper than any of the aquifers that people extract potable water from. Um, and so there's, there's minimal potential for contamination. Um, there's potential for camp contamination when water comes back up and it's stored in, um, in uh, uh, ponds, but again, if it's, if it's not done carefully. And if, if fracking is done carefully and there's appropriate regulation, um, yes, you can have an accident, but it's, it's, it's quite rare. Um, and, um, and you mentioned earthquakes before. And, and, and again, if fracking is done in areas where there's uh, seismic, uh, seismic instability, you get earthquakes. And so it's, it shouldn't be done in those places. But if it's done um, in areas that are more stable, you don't get earthquakes. You know? So it's, just, it's a matter of being smart, which unfortunately a lot of people aren't. And a lot of people, um, somehow their smartness goes away when they think about money. Um, Are you saying you know, that, that with fracking is done correctly, that there's no pollution of water? Do you answer that? So um, one of the, and I, the video touches upon this. So for decades in New Mexico, the industry has done what's called vertical fracking. That's conventional fracking. So most recently has been the horizontal fracking. And, and so what, again, needs to be um, studied and considered is the type of geology that you are, in fact, going into. So we look at the Albuquerque Basin, the basin that right now we all get our drinking water from. That geology is very fractured because that's how we got the Sandia Mountains. So the Manco Shale that companies want to frack is actually, you can see it on top of the Sandia Mountains. It's that top layer. So you think about that layer being that high, what had to happen geologically for that mountain to be up that high, that shale layer, which is actually at the Rio Grande River, thousands of feet below. So the geology of the particular area has to be considered prior to fracking. So to your question, what Darian was speaking about was the Permian Basin, down in southern New Mexico, the San Juan Basin, they have a very different geology than the Albuquerque Basin. It's, it's like a bowl. It's, a, it's this bowl. So there's not as many fractures. There's not as many uh, pathways that can potentially uh, contaminate those aquifers that sit on those top layers that people use for their groundwater, drinking water. But in Albuquerque, because of the fractures and in the Albuquerque Rio Grande Basin, because of those fractures, they create pathways. So you could go th a couple thousand feet below, but that pressure that's created by, hyd uh, by uh, hydraulic fracking, as well as the injection of those chemicals in there, can now travel up those fractures into our drinking water aquifers. And that this is a case that happened in uh, Wyoming in the Pavilion Basin, where they've actually detected chemicals in the drinking water, they can't drink it anymore, um, that were directly related. And it is a very similar geology that, like we have in the, in the Albuquerque Basin. All right, and that's going to go ahead and conclude. And, and you're more than welcome to step to any of the panelists if you have more questions or want to follow up, but I do appreciate you for coming out today here and hearing the diverse views on all of this. And I wish you a safe travel home. And you can find the podcast of the discussion you heard today 
on Kavu's website, and I'm sure it's all over those little papers you got when you walked in. But thank you again to our panel. Definitely a round of applause. <laughs>